that in my head. Um, and that's again, I mean, it was like, oh fuck, I better get this right, you know. And that thing, I think, that, that, that particular dynamic, that notion of we're, we're telling a cinematic tale here, but first and foremost, we're serving the experiences of these men. That became a notion that was infectious, I think, to almost everybody involved in, in the production. Certainly the writers, the band of writers that collected, you know, John Orloff and Bruce McKenna, and Max Fry and Graham Yost, Eric Bork, Tom himself, we're all infected by the same idea. I mean, it was the most egoless period of, of development that I'd ever experienced and I probably ever will experience. And I think that that spirit, that notion of those high standards and putting the men and their experience first, rather than trying to serve any other you know, needs of narrative for making a television series, I think it infected the actors as well. It infected everybody involved. And they realized that they weren't just making a miniseries. They were, they were shouldering an enormous responsibility. And we had one shot at it. And that was pretty magical. I mean, it doesn't happen very often. And a lot has to be said about uh, HBO, Chris Albrecht, and this notion that he had, which was astonishing at the time, still is, that you assemble the right people and then you just leave them alone because they know what they're doing and executives at the studio don't. So the most remarkable thing about that whole period of time is that we went through the, de the development of the scripts, which I was sort of supervising because everybody got that, the Bible and I supervised the development of the scripts and everybody went off and got created their own relationships with the principal figures and characters, the men of their episodes. And I chose specifically to write one, five and 10, the beginning, middle and the end. Um, during that entire time that we were developing the scripts and by the time that the final scripts were delivered, we received not one single note from HBO, which is completely unheard of. Because Albrecht had decided, look, it's Tom, it's Playtone, it's it's this group of of creatives, and what the hell do we know? You know, the way they like to do these miniseries is uh, more like a movie than like a TV series. So there is no showrunner really. Jenderson was the the originator of the whole thing, um, but there wasn't that kind of um, central thing. So you were just working on your episode. You know, with each episode, the challenge was we want to tell that portion of the war. First of all, we had to figure out how many episodes is it going to be, which took a while, right? And how are you going to divide up what happens in which episode? Yeah. But once we knew we had a Carantan episode, one of the things I was obsessed with, I know, and we were always trying to do was how do you find a personal story within each episode where we have a particular character we follow, where they have a beginning, middle, and end in the story that's got some emotion and drama to it, right? We knew we'd have winners and Nixon in every episode, which would kind of update, uh, update us on where they were as a company, what was happening in the war at large, but we also wanted something personal, right? And each episode you look at kind of, kind of has that, or we try to do that. So the Bly thing, we had the one paragraph on hysterical blindness, and then later it mentions that he got shot in the neck when they were checking out that farmhouse. Um, and that was it. That's all that's in the book. Um, and um, I don't remember whose idea it was at the time, but at some point it was, well, Blythe would be a perfect character to follow throughout the episode, make this the Blythe episode. And, uh, you know, like you guys as a writer, I probably relate to a character like Blythe more than, you know, any of the other people, because that's how I feel I probably would have been if I was there, you know, scared to death and unable to function, basically. All of, all of the actors 
are are doing are trying their fucking hardest to represent the man that they are portraying and and we're doing everything that we can to do it the right way and honor them the right way and still today we we hold that dear we hold that dear we hold that dear so as you're working hard you're getting these scripts and they're coming your way and you have little bits in each episode and i just remember when i first opened up episode nine no one told me or warned me that hey bud this is gonna really lean on prakani and a journey with prakani so I remember being in my room and flipping through the pages and just sinking and almost like crying, getting so emotional and watching all this and reading everything that Prakani has to do. And, and, and it was, and just the fact that the little things I got to ride in a Jeep with Winters and Nixon was such a, just reading that line to me was how hard we worked from boot camp all the way to there. And then obviously you get to set. And, and, and Ross always says this is the producers and the writers and the directors, they did a lot by design. And one of the things that they did was they held back from us seeing certain things and they held back from us seeing that set, right? Do you guys remember that? Yes. They didn't like bring us on there to do rehearsals and any yeah. of that. I, I got to go do a rehearsal because I had to cut the chains. But a lot of what you saw, a lot of the reactions were pretty much what most of us were really thinking when we first saw this this place and, I and remember, to with, sorry but I'm, i don't want to interrupt you but i remember that you came back from that rehearsal yeah and, and i was like wait do you guys see this this is oh it's, no it's, you it's, i remember you came up to me you're like you can't understand what we're about to go do right now you like i remember that moment wow yeah i remember that was breakfast wasn't it yeah 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 it, it, it was like this is yeah. eyes like, it was like you but, have no idea what's about to happen right now yeah we were totally left yeah, in the so dark it, and it was it, it was really tough because we did. We had a lot of fun on that. A lot, a lot of fun on Band of Brothers. I mean, the camaraderie was amazing. The brotherhood is is unmatched uh, in anything that is, is on cinema, in my opinion. And uh, when you got to set, knowing the subject matter and how powerful it was, and David Frankel, uh, you know, a lot of the joking stopped and, and it got really, really serious. And... To go back to what you guys are saying, the grotesque of these guys and how they were. When I first read what John wrote about, you know, this is the first part of fucking what I've seen. I got a hot chow, is warm chow. In Germany's because being I get to wipe my own ass with all that whole riff. When I read that at night, and I knew I was gonna I was looking at the at the one line that we called to see when we're gonna shoot that. I was so amped up for so many days of how I was gonna do that that my idea was I was grabbing, I didn't know this actor. We were told to you know, treat the replacements like replacements. I know a lot of you know that already. And I didn't know this actor. So when we were going to rehearse, I literally physically told uh, David, I said, David, I'm going to grab him, fling him down, stick my knee in his throat, and say, it's the best part of fucking one scene. I, got, I was going to go nuts on him. And that was my take on it. And so we rehearsed it, and David sits me down. He goes, yeah, yeah, listen. Uh, I think that's something that Jimmy Maggio would do. Now, David don't know me that well, because I'm in the <laughs> trenches with this. David just was like, hey, listen, man, I think that's something that Jimmy Mattia would do. I'm not so sure Frank Picanti would do that after being in a war all these years. I don't know, like, if he'd put his hands on another soldier. And I was like, I don't know, David. He's like, well, can you try it that way for me? And I did. I tried it that way. And we spoke afterwards. And I, and I was like, you know, I, that's, that's working better. He's like, yeah, I think it's going to work a little better for the for the film. I don't think you'd put your hands on him. And it did. I mean, that all ultimately that's kind of, it was really tough for directors to come in and kind of position us and for us to really agree with them to what they were saying. Now, as far as Frank, Frank didn't single-handedly and John, this one, I, I want to really hand this off to you for one second, because I get, I get this question asked a lot is, you know, the creative uh, uh, differences and, and stuff that, that, you know, Frank didn't single-handedly come across the concentration camp and find the first concentration camp for easy company. He's very vocal about that. But Frank understood this is movies. These are the core guys that we've been following. You're not going to have some guy that you never met or we don't know. The, the, the critical thing, and I think that's why it gets so hard for fans to understand, is the writers and producers and directors and the actors, we were so bent on making sure things were accurate. So accurate. I mean, that was just a key focal thing. That when something is not, it's like, well, how could you do that? How could you do that? And I get that question, John, all the time about, well, why would you allow them, Frank, to do that? And 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 so that's what you know. I want to hand it off to you because I get that question a lot. I'm like, I don't. You got to ask the writer. 
Well, um, you know, episode nine was, as I was saying, was was always different because um, there was not a lot in the book about it, but we knew that we wanted to show it. You know, I mean, Stephen and Tom both were like, "This is this is an important episode," and it's a way for us to explore the Holocaust. Um, in a way, one one of the things that I love about the episode and its placement in the show is that you never see it coming. You have no, f you have no clue that, that this is going to, huh? Yeah. You may swear. Think oh, thank you. Big points, yeah. You, you, you have no fucking clue anywhere when you're in episode one, when you're in episode three, when you're in episode seven, when you're in episode nine, you have no clue what's about to happen. Um, until Percanti, and, and even then, I don't think you really know, you know, as Percanti's running and Major Winters, has anybody seen Major Winters? Um, I still think you don't quite know what you're about to see. And that's, I mean, it's, it's great, I think, because it, 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 it introduces people to the Holocaust um, in a context as our guys did, and as that generation did which is yeah. to say, what? What the fuck is going on? You know, right. what is this place? You know, and that episode, it's, again, episode two, I take incredible pride with every little moment is as accurate as I could possibly make it. You know, um, uh, there's that moment in episode two where Lipton, I think it's Lipton, is on his belly and he's sort of trying to get towards the guns and and there was just, and this was just a random story Lipton told me. You know, somebody was next to him and put his head up and was shot. And I was like, oh well, that's great. We got to put that. I mean, so every detail in two was really as accurate as as I could do it. And then in episode nine, as I said, we we were starting from a different place in that nobody would really tell me what happened. You know, nobody would really tell me the truth. So by default, I had to sort of take dramatic license and, and make choices. And it's, I think it's the most thematically driven episode of the show. Um, um, and that kind of spoke to everything. When Winters came to set, when he came to England, and he was meeting all of the guys and stuff like that, and uh, we were changing, coming to set, some guys changed quicker, so that he was talking, he's like, Where, where's, where's Joe Toy? Where's Joe Toy? And I said, hey, oh, sir, I play Joe, Joe Toy, blah, blah, blah. And he just started tearing up. And it's just, it, it's, when you see what these men meant to each other and the moments and the, and, 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 and the history and everything that you, 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 to this day, when, when those moments like that just, just touch me, truly. An interesting thing about, um, about Dick, um, well, there's so many interesting things, but but it was, I guess, 99, I think, is when I wrote it, um, maybe 2000, I can't remember, and it was just when the Holocaust denialism was sort of taking root uh, in, in public consciousness, particularly in the UK. I, I think that all kind of started in the UK, um, that one that one fellow, and um, uh you know, Dick, who was a, a, a religious man, he was a Mennonite and, and um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I mean, we never talk politics, but I don't think of Dick as a, as a liberal guy in any sense of the word. Um, but he, he, sorry, uh, he, he was really upset about Holocaust denialism. And I can still hear, he really wanted me to get this episode right. And we talked about it a lot. And the thing that I just always remember is he was deeply offended by, by denialism. 
And he kept on saying to me, I was there. I saw it. It happened. I was there. Um, and so it, yeah, I'm just happy. I, I'm really happy that I got it right. It's interesting to hear the whole, the historians talk about the his, like the full history because you're dealing in the full scope of what was happening. And everything that, that, that our show is about was not dealing with that uh, in the way of just making it about the men. So people have come to me over, over time. I'm sure that everyone else in the, involved in the show has said or has, has heard as well. People are like, oh my gosh, you must be like a World War II historian now. And it's, no. The, I could tell you about those specific things that we did. Uh, and I could tell you more about the other men than I could about the events that were happening. And that, and that is absolutely by design of the show. This is not, you know, the show wasn't, which is nor the normal storytelling of a, of a war uh, situation is through the eyes of the leaders. Um, you know, and it's like, you know, Patton's third army swept through. Well, okay, Patton's third swept through. There's a... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of little stuff that happened during that sweeping, and there are a lot of nights and days and mornings and breakfasts and and men lost, and 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 that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the the, the micro of what was happening, you know, and the inner relationships between the men. Um, so it, it's it's fascinating to hear all of this, you know, history all the time, and sort of go, oh crap, I didn't realize that, you know, and bridge too, you know, bridge too far. Talking about Market Garden, most people, you know, know the broad strokes of what had happened, but we were dealing with those men on the ground, interacting with each other and the immediate orders that they were being given or getting from each other. So it's, uh, we're, we're, we're living in two sort of different worlds and it's, it's pretty fascinating to, uh, to hear you guys talk about it. Most of the men uh, of the greatest generation did fall silent and wouldn't talk about their experiences. And then this happened. And Band of Brothers seemed to have an effect uh, across the nation, from what I understand. The numbers of hundreds of times I've heard the story about, you know, my grandfather or my uncle or whatever, having seen the show suddenly turned to us, we had no idea. Over and over again, we had no idea. But they were able to say, you've seen that now. Now let me explain to you what my part in all that. You know, because luckily, even though it was about a company of paratroopers, the 506 of the 101st Airborne, there was something about the show that it, it felt inclusive of anybody who was in the European theater from training to the end. And it was that frame of reference that was so vitally needed. And that was, at, at, I think, began with Saving Private Ryan and was followed by us. And it enabled so many of these gentlemen to unburden themselves and to talk and to share with their families the story of the best years of their lives uh, before they died. Yeah, that was incredibly important. So it, 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 it came at the right time and, and it allowed so many more of these gentlemen to be able to un unburden themselves and to tell their stories and to share with successive generations the things that they may never, might never have talked about and gone to their graves with. So that's enormous. And I think for me, that's the most gratifying thing about the whole, the whole affair. But I remember you going in to see Tom and it, it was the greatest audition I'd ever done, uh, you know, and, and, and I prepped for it like I never do before. I, I was walking around solo listening to Taxi Driver on a loop. I mean, I was so intense and, um, and I'd visualized I'd visualized meeting Tom, what I was going to say to him, seeing all the people from LA there. I visualized the whole thing and it all kind of panned out. And, you know, the door opened and I said, Tom, I said, I've walked straight off the street, straight into the hotel. I didn't have to wait. And here I am. He said, that's how we like to do it, Mark. And I said, that's how I like it, Tom. And everybody started laughing. And he said, in this strange he said, we're going to cut this, this and this. And I, I remember I had the sides in my back pocket. I didn't take them out. And I sat down and he said, um, Freddie's going to read with you and Billy's going to be on camera. He said, and in this strange atmosphere, just begin when you're ready. And, and I remember 
looking up at, they said they were rolling. I looked up at the ceiling for about 30 seconds. It's a long time to look at the ceiling. I looked up and then I looked down and I, I said this earlier and I opened me gob. And as soon as I opened me gob, I went, because you know inside, don't you? You got your internal thing going. And I went. Give the line, give the line, give the line, give the line. I can't remember what it was, but I just went, well, it would have been your line to me. Yeah. And, um, and I went, I fucking nailed it. I knew it. I just knew it. And, and I spoke for two minutes. And at the end, a tear rolled down my face. <laughs> it was fucking sight. It's the greatest audition of my life in my whole career. Greatest audition of my life in my whole career. Total silence. And then Hanks did what Hanks does best when he blows smoke. It's incredible, isn't it? And I, and I walked out. I said, I said, I guess that's what all the nerves were for. And he goes, yeah, I guess it was. And I said goodbye. I walked out on the street. I phoned my mum and uh, cried my eyes out. And I said, I think I've just done something quite special. And I, th I said, yeah. I think, and I think Steven Spielberg might see it. And I just cried my eyes out. Captain Die, in case any of you in the audience don't know, he played Colonel Sink in the series, uh, as well as being the military advisor. And he was with us from, you know, in the writing stages at some point, had some input. And, you know, there were a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, he changed even the platoon structure and the idea there was like a weapons platoon, which I don't think in the real company there was. I know he moved things around that made sense for what he was doing. And there was some push and pull at times, for sure, between us on the writing side and Dale, um, uh, but we obviously trusted that he knew more than any of us knew about, you know, what you would really say in the actual moment of combat. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think I responded well to the whole boot camp scenario. I, I really, I actually really enjoyed it. I, I, um, and I think Mark, you would have done as well if you'd been there. I, so do I, I agree. I totally you there's a certain, really well. uh, there was, it, it was, you know, it was, it was like 240 hours of continuous improvisation. <laughs> It was, you know, it was 10 days, relentless, you know, in terms of an acting uh, uh, kind of experience. I was, I was really intrigued and excited by that. And you kind of give yourself over to it. And also Tom turned up with Spielberg, I think very early on. I don't know if you remember this, Rick, and, uh, and they made this kind of emotive speech. Oh, it was wonderful. We, I mean, it, it was, it was amazing. We were all standing up at the end, sort of cheering. And, and I thought, hang on a minute, I'm not even American, but I'm really caught up in this this whole moment of, of, of what it is that we're portraying and who these guys are and, and what this, this, this thing is. And it was, it was amazing how you, you kind of, by giving yourself over to it, that, that it became really useful and, and, and enjoyable every moment of it. And of course there was hard long nights when it rained and we stayed up all night doing sentry guard and orienteering where none of us knew what we were doing, walking around in the darkness and the next day after no sleep running around firing weapons in the Fibia village and I mean <laughs> carnage, it was absolute mayhem. The, the, the checklist of yup, you know, the, the checklist of yes, yes, you know, you're homesick, you're tired, you're like, yeah, 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 got all, that's where we are. And then, and then the other side of that is that really the only thing that's there is each other. The only thing that's there is each other. The only thing that's there is each other. Beyond that. So, so you know, it's like there's, it really, there's something about the boot camp experience through the shooting of everything that when you get to the moment of that shot where we crane up and Ron walks in, no one's thinking about cinematically what's going on. I'm just fucking smoking a cigarette. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When you said this is dog you said this is dog shit, it was you talk it wasn't you talking to me. It was Lowe's talking to Talbot. Fuck yeah. Like, was, this is dude. fucking exactly what it was. I don't even know who Rick Gomez was when that was going on. I was fucking George. I never wasn't called Rick Gomez from 10 months. <laughs> I had to relearn who fucking Rick Gomez was. I I was George Buzz, man. For I, that was the only name. So yeah. Come on, listen. Let's let's be real. Ross, Matt, Rick. How yeah. long did you guys keep dog tags on after you wrapped? Did you take them off on the day you wrapped? Oh, no, I didn't. Put mine on right now. He's still got his on now. <laughs> mine are on for like another two years. Concept just becomes, you know, the bond that we had was was bigger than. It just sounds like act of bullshit sometimes.
but the bond that, that was created that was the master stroke from the producers putting us in boot camp. That was the genius move that was made right at the beginning. I know, you know, they've since done it and they've done it previously. That, that bonding moment for us, like solidified everything that you see on the show. Because what, what it did was it allowed us to be our guys within our guys. So like, like what Rick was saying earlier, I mean, we, we didn't call each other by our real names until probably month 10. I think we were in a bar in Soho when you first heard my accent. I mean, it was like, you know, I, I, I don't think we ever dropped it. And so we were like, we were so glued together that when it finished, of course, there's always that little moment at the end of a long job where you're like, ah, okay, all right. We, we put our shoes into something else now and we feel it out. But it was terribly sad. I would agree. I mean, I think even though people were homesick and people were, you know, ready to move to the next thing or whatever, just knowing that we wouldn't have that thing every day was really tough because none of yeah. us spent time in our trailers. None of us, we, we hung out every weekend together. We hung out every night together. We'd always have, you know what I mean? It was like, it was, and for that to, it was a breakup. There's a framing aspect of it. I know that I felt like we had reached a point in which we understood between each other how important our friendship was. And we had experiences that without each other, we probably, I probably wouldn't have made it. So, so as friends, we became, as, as men, we became these friends and, and the importance of those friendships led us directly to the gates of episode nine. The boot camp thing also, I was thinking about this the other day, in a really clever way, accomplished this thing for me. And I think for all of us where you fucked up. So like, it was okay to fuck up. And, and, and then uh -huh. like, okay, cool. We can fuck up and lean on each other and go, don't do, do, don't, don't do that. And th you start learning as a group instead of just one asshole who doesn't know anything. We're right. a group of assholes who don't know anything and we're gonna help <laughs> each other out get better. And so that's really what happened, right? That, that we needed each other in order to survive. So right, at the yeah. end of the show, at the end of the show, for, I'll start, I'll start, this is a very quick story. I'm not gonna take much time to tell it. I've had a tray in my, uh, Jim, you don't, you don't even know this. I had a tray in my, uh, my closet. I've had it for, for 25 years, since I was a young man and been on my own. And I've taken it from apartment to house to living, and it's collected a whole bunch of shit, this tray. Uh, cufflinks that people gave me with funny stories, bracelets my kids made me, friendship bracelets my kids made me, old rings that don't fit anymore. It's, it's like these totems. It's a tray of little totems. And, and one of the totems in that tray is, is Percanti's. Uh, oh, wow. Pippo. And Jim, Jim gave me this when we wrapped. And he, wow. and he said, I'll see, you wow. state I'll, I'll see you stateside, but take care of that for me until I see you. And that's been in my tray for, for 21 years. He's wow. been blaming me for stealing that. Now <laughs> <laughs> you know it's gold. But but when but I, so so I just want to say one thing. When people say actor bullshit, this is a part of my life that I carried around from apartment to house to house. It's it's had it sits with kids bracelets and all this other. It's a part of your life. So so if there isn't proof right there, oh. I always tell people, you know, it. I would never insult any veteran by saying it was like being in a war it wasn't but it was like being in the army a little bit you know um you know and richard can tell you when he was shooting his episode you know we were like we we had to march to set every day we'd be out in the woods all day you know for like 16 hours um even boot camp i remember on the second day of boot camp i, I looked at neil and uh, we're standing, we had a moment's rest and we looked at each other and said, man, this is unbelievably hard and I'm exhausted. He was like, I'm so exhausted too. And we both realized at the same moment, it was noon on day two of boot camp, And we both <laughs> felt like we'd been there for two months, <laughs> you know? And, and I would say Neil's a pretty tough guy. You know, I like to think of a, I'm a reasonably tough, you know, athletic guy. And uh, I mean, we were, so overwhelmed at times by the whole experience but what what an honor and a treat to do it and you know to be able to represent these men on screen in a way that you know it's it lives on you know every every 
so often I'll get an email from someone or a phone call. Hey, I'm watching History Channel. I never miss it when it comes on. And, you know, we're just representing the guys. The second day, the second day of boot camp, I had stolen this banana from the, uh, Rick knows what I'm saying. This is, first of all, we're still, we're still wide-eyed and scared. Yeah. You don't, you don't even want to meet anybody or talk to anybody or whatever. You're just trying to follow the rules. And I had stolen this banana from the, from the mess hall. And I had it and I was, for some odd reason, I picked it up like a phone and I said, hey, Muck, it's for you. And I threw it to Rick Spade and he grabs the banana and goes, yellow, oh, you're a banana. (laughs) And I went, that's the guy right there. I'm a lucky (laughs) bastard to get to work with that every day. One of the things that's overlooked is we talk about the band of brothers, the real band of the real brothers. But these guys are right up there. And this is something, yes, we've, during our 35, 40 years, 50 for him, years of uh, this industry, we've had an actor here, a couple actors here, but never have we had a group. And I think Freddie will agree with this. Uh, an entire group that became of their own band of brothers. And short of being under fire, they are as tight as we are. It, it's an incredible thing that we've never experienced. I certainly have it. This group, you're absolutely right. They are so tight, and it happened from the get-go. Yeah. I mean, we had cadre like Freddie and and um, uh, some other sergeants down in the trenches with them, and everyone worked worked on them and at them from the get-go. And what one or two minor exceptions, these guys, as you said. Well, yeah, but but guys <laughs> get together get together every year. They are so tight. Um, it, it, it's just so admirable, and uh, we we just have so much respect for them for that. One one of the things that that always used to tickle me when we were at Longmore doing uh, Band of Brothers. Yeah, you you'll recall that. My office, the commanding officer's uh, office, was right across the courtyard, which was our drill field yeah. uh, from the barracks. And uh, and you, Mike and I, and and it would would sit back there um, as CEO and XO and watch our cadre work yeah. the guys out there. And and it was it was like an absolute course in psychology. I mean, we could look at him and I'd say, see that one? Now, watch what he's going to do. And here's, that's his vulnerability. That's what he's worried about himself. Or, or I'd look at the other guy and say, you know, he's still acting. He, he hasn't so bought into the program. So we need to pay attention to that one and, and get with him. And we would develop this, this shorthand between us. But just by watching you guys, and then we would have the cadre meeting and I, you know, Freddie Joe and, and the others would be in there and I say, now listen, uh, X needs the following attention. So we're going to put him on the guard roster and, and I want him walking out alone by himself in the cold and in the rain with a bayonet fixed. And that's going to give him the time he needs to think and digest. And we would, we would do things like that. Or, um, uh, if your cadre is is a, a a tremendous amount of really smart guys, really smart leaders like ours were, um, there on Band of Brothers, we could just shorthand it. We could just say, you know, motivation problem here. And Freddie Joe, oh, one of the guys, would say, <laughs> "Got it, Skipper." And boom, they go after they go after that guy. But we developed that by watching each one of you for your individual buttons. That's because there were some similarities, but each one of you is different, and we knew that. I mean, I've, I've actually just watched it just before we came on. So I've never, I've never watched the series, so I, I've never watched it. But um, I, I've seen my episode, of, you know, a couple of times, and uh, it's, it's, it's harrowing. It's really yeah. harrowing, mm. and 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 it's so wonderful. You know, it's one of those things I think where you look back at the end of your career and you go, "Wow, that that was something." 
and right. and you know and you boys were were amazing in it and uh and i just laughing at me and dex in the foxhole you know it's just it, i actually had a tear when i watched it i was like wow this is yeah but but also i remember the first time i spoke to him on the phone uh we and we were shooting and i remember being in that trailer park that we were all in out on the, on the strip there and and asking something quite casually, but he talked about the, the night that he landed and the next morning. Um, and he talked about the Germans that came walking down the hill to the farm that he was in a barn and that he knew that, that they were gonna have to kill them, that they were coming down to collect milk and they had no idea, these young men, that they were about to die. And he and he talked really kind of openly about that to me and and, and he was in tears. I could hear that it was still really difficult for him all this time later. And, and I think that's when I re it really landed on me, the impact of the responsibility that we all held collectively, the, the story of these people that we were telling were real. And, and that, and that, I know it sounds stupid, but, you know, up until then, it had been like an elaborate kind of acting game. It, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't tangible. He, he, he certainly, for me, uh, made it, much more real and, and affecting uh, uh, than, than ever before with that. And, and, and he, he, yeah, he didn't speak about his experience a lot, but I knew that he was still living it. How heartbroken were you when the show ended? <laughs> it was heartbroken. It was heartbroken because we shot it, we shot it out of order. So some guys went home at certain periods earlier than others. And you were like, whoa, 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 what do you mean? Yeah, dude, I'm wrapped on Friday. Like, so, I'm not going to be see like, no, I got orders to go back to the States. I'm like, what? Or oh, yeah. go back to Ireland. So like, you have much? I'm not going to see. I mean, look, it, it was, it was tough. I, me and uh, uh, Roth, we were the youngest ones on the set. Uh, we were probably the two youngest ones, I think, uh, of, of, of the guys. And uh, I was having the best time of my life. And, and there was no doubt about it. So when this was coming to an end, I, I was completely heartbroken. I didn't know what I was going to do without these guys because I was a kid, a little bit of a troublemaker. And these are all my, they, these are all my older brothers. They became family to me. They, they sort of, I saw the way that they worked, the way they treated people, the way people treated them, the way they spoke, the way, you know, the way they came correct with the work. And that foundation is still with me today. I, I think for me, the, the my responsibility, and uh, and I can I can safely say we all felt this responsibility because I was close friends with the majority of the guys, and I know what our our goals were as individuals and as a unit was to be sure that we got our shit out of the way so that the real guys came through in the series, right. so that Rich Bate, Scott Grimes, Tim Matthews, actor bullshit. out of the way, let these guys be who they were. And so that that, so that they, so that what they accomplished or what they did or who they were is captured on screen. And so going to, you know, it was, this is not a show where you get the script and like, they're killing off my character. This is a real guy. This is when he died. This is how he died. These are the men he died with. This is the battle in which it took place. And so it, you know, my feeling was my goal was to leave it all on the field, to be sure that I had done what I needed to do so that when the Muck family and I felt a tremendous amount of responsibility to the Muck family, a tremendous amount of responsibility to Skip Muck, who I never met, obviously, but to his, uh, you know, his family, his bloodline that remained behind and mourned his loss to that day and still to this day, I owed them a three-dimensional character. I owed them a real guy. And I, I recall having beers with Babe, Babe Heffron, the real Babe Heffron, and Bill Garnier in London one night. And, you know, to them, we, we looked exactly like those men, so we were those men. It wasn't, hey, Rich, blah, blah, blah. It was Muck. When he, especially a couple yeah. of cocktails in, Babe started talking to me as muck oh. and he was telling me he's like we tried to find parts of your body we looked around the book says you know something i can't remember what the point his point of contention was he's like 
we looked, we climbed trees. We tried to find something to send home to bury. We couldn't find anything. And of course, as a young man, you, you, that's an intense, it's intense to look in the eyes of the man who's saying that to you and know that you will never actually truly understand the experience this man has losing this person. But you better damn well do justice to the person that he misses. Can I say something? Yes, I, I think one of the things that impressed me most about the team of actors that I was given on the day one was how much, and this is after what you've been saying, Nick, is how much they really did care about mm. representing the people that they were playing in a, in, a trip, in a way, in giving tribute to them, being honest to them, because they knew that there were real men behind these who had given their lives or, you know, their bodies. And, yeah. Uh, and I think that... That was very dominant on set. There was no fucking around and people no. wasting time. People knew that this had to be done properly, not just because it was, a, you know, I'm sure all of them have done it as actors, but there was another layer that I think um, took over and was nurtured all the way through the show, I think. It's what makes it special. I'd like to add, it wasn't, I mean, that sense of commitment um, also went through all the departments, you know, costume, mm. makeup, Everybody felt that it was something, it wasn't just another gig, you know, everybody, all the hundreds of people who worked on it uh, really were dedicated in a way that was a little abnormal. And there's something to be said for that I, is a detail of production that we haven't talked about that's very different from Band of Brothers in that, and, and good that it was different. We were always who we are our characters and where we were supposed to be. Right. You know, early on, going back to the early on description that Tom Hanks gave us in, in the, in the um, mess hall, when we all arrived, he said, we're not making a war movie. We're filming a war. You worry right. about fighting and doing your job. We'll, we'll figure out how to capture it on film. You know, it wasn't going to be the old, okay, now we're doing a close up, guys. We're swapping lenses. Like those conversations weren't conversations we were privy to. We went and did our stuff. And right. So I always told people, if you're watching Winters charge a hill and 200 yards in the back is where the mortar guys were, that's Scott Grimes, Rich Spade, and Tim Matthews. Like, you Absolutely. know, it, it, was, it was never not, we were always who we were. Me, so I, I think when people talk about the, the bonding of the characters, our characters were bonding off camera as the characters as much as we were bonding on camera as the characters because we yeah. were always who we were doing yeah. what we were supposed to be doing. We, we did more work. You know, if you, if you, if anybody out there doesn't know what a call sheet is, it's the, it's the daily sheet that says what scenes we're doing. And then it has the numbers of characters. I don't know how small the numbers were for the hundreds and hundreds of characters for every scene. <laughs> there was, there was a good six, seven months where every single call sheet had that giant line of one through 112, you know, uh, you were in the back. If Damian Lewis and 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 Ron Livingston were doing a scene on a on a tarmac, and, and there's a thousand soldiers in the background, me, Rick, and Tim were you, Matt, all of us were were, were we were those guys. Yeah, we were right. acting like geniuses, but it just never made. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what's great. But I think that's so. I think that's so important. We never had to go to somebody. Hey, how'd the scene go? How was your day's work? We were there. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. we, we, we saw everything happen and play out. And I think that's actually really, yeah. really important. One of one's great fears as a director, because you have so little time, you have to be, you can't any longer, unless maybe you are Stephen, and I, but he doesn't do that because he's so prepared. You can't come on a set and go, I've got an idea. I wonder if we might, you can't really do that anymore in today's business. You have to know what you're doing coming in. And what I felt was normally one dreads when, when an actor comes, or a star usually, comes up and goes, Richard, I've had an idea. And you go, oh, fuck, he's had an idea. <laughs> We're going to be a, you know, fight a day over. Huh? Yeah. I didn't get that feeling on the set of Band of Brothers. I just didn't. I got the feeling that all the guys had ideas and had suggestions. Dale knew the business. But every, but I felt if I listened, and I, I'm not a great listener, as my wife will tell you, um, it, it just worked. It was just, I was able to sort of say, well, I, yeah, that's... I was able to maybe direct it a bit, but the ideas that were coming off the floor from the people, because you'd all researched it so well, because you took it so seriously, because the scripts were based on, you know, were well-structured and John's script was solid. It, uh, when I say it was easy, that's what I mean, it was easy. You just, there wasn't the arguments and the fighting and the, and the 
the stuff that often goes on on the floor, which you, my job is to calm down and not make it, not m let the actors be aware that there's a lot going on behind the scenes because you've got to do your job and you can't be affected by it if possible. But I felt the atmosphere on the set was remarkably good. That's why I meant it was easy. You know, we're, I, I've said before in other interviews that there was no egos involved in Band of Brothers. People You're took right. themselves out of scenes because their character, the guy they talked to on the phone the night before said, I wasn't on that march. And right. an actor, an actor who by the title is a narcissistic being who wants to be on screen <laughs> is walking into a space going, I'm not here. I'm not supposed to be here. So I'm not going to yeah, do right. this. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, and this is so unlike, but it's because we were all in that headspace. And, and, and so that we were all those guys, there was no, to, to, everything Scott said is true. And there was no bitching about it. It was what we did. We were easy company. We were, those guys, if Weapon yeah. Platoon was back doing something, then Weapon Platoon was back doing something. And it didn't matter that we literally couldn't see the cameras <laughs> with a spyglass. It didn't matter. It had nothing to do with anything. We did our thing. We reset. We did it 40 times. And then, you know, we moved on to the next thing. We were all doing, we were all part of the company doing what the company did whenever the company did anything. And that's what rounds out, I mean, that's what makes the show the show. That's what makes the retelling of what those men did, I think, as accurate as it is, because we were, we were all in it to be there, to be the guy whenever the guy was there. Um, if I do nothing else in my life, I did that, you know, and I'm really proud that people. I, I mean, like I was saying earlier, that people have learned about the Holocaust because of Band of Brothers. Um, I've been told Kirk was was telling me the the guy that works for the works with the Holocaust Museum in, in, in DC, that they, they'll ask when schools come, you know, how did you first hear about the Holocaust? And the number one answer is Band of Brothers, it's Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers. And that is an incredibly humbling, um, you know, thing. And, and I think, again, it comes back to, you don't know you're about to learn about the Holocaust. You didn't sign up for that when you started watching Band of Brothers. You know, you signed up for it when you watched Schindler's List. You know yeah. you're about to see what you're about to see. When you start episode one of Band of Brothers, 98% of the people have no idea that in episode nine, they're gonna see this. And I gotta say, and my whole family <laughs> said, Rick, um, they couldn't picture anyone else, anyone else but you playing Skip Muck. Really, my sisters, my mom, my dad, they all wow. said, he skipped, he skipped wow. us. So, wow. um, and uh, it, it was just an amazing, um, an amazing transformation for my mom and my family um, to really now know who this man was that my mom really had a hard time talking about. The, the, the story under Band of Brothers and, and, Graham, you talked about your relationship with Lipton. And so it's just, it's just dovetails onto that is we had to find each other. You know, you had to go find Lipton and find him and talk to him. I had to find Eileen and Becky and, and their mom and, and talk to them and to get these stories, to get this information because it wasn't ready, readily available. I'm not sure Band of Brothers would have been the same show with easy access to the internet. I think there's something about having to dig and research and find, you know, there's something about a, a guy emailed me after Googling my name is not as interesting a story as like, there's a crazy person calling everybody named <laughs> Muck in Buffalo. <laughs> we either need to alert the authorities or talk to this guy, you know? And, and, and I, I just think it's part of, it's, it, it's part of the, the story of the story we were telling mm -hmm. because I, I, my flat in London was wallpapered with really great color copies that they would send me of all the correspondence they had with Muck, including the Western Union telegram, including the deceased uh, mm -hmm. return to sender deceased envelope, you know, and that's, you know, that humanized it for the human playing the guy because I, you know, I needed, I, I needed skip. But I didn't get Skip. I got people who love Skip. And I got to find out wow. who he was through their mm -hmm. eyes. And that was fantastic. But, you know, it's Thank interesting you is, you know, you and, uh, you and James and George and Frank were really close uh, during the war and after the war. When I look at the 
pictures from the reunions. Uh, whenever I see them, those two guys are always together. So, so anyway, hey, you, you guys all did a great job. Uh, it's amazing that, uh, you know, you did something that my dad was involved in. And forever and ever and ever, uh, everybody will always remember who George Luz is. Uh, everybody will always remember who George Luz is. It was really important for me to show all the hard work to his family and to portray Frank in cinematic history. It was very important. And we worked really hard, each one of us, and each actor worked hard to, to, to represent the veteran on that screen. That was the most important job for any one of us to do. So when I read episode nine, I was just thrilled, like, oh, okay, there's Frank is now, everybody's going to know who Frank McConkey is. And, uh, and he was a dear friend. I got to travel the, the world with him and, and, and his footsteps through the, you know, through his entire war experience to where he was even shot in Foy. And, uh, you know, at the, and I also was honored to say goodbye to him as well. So a great guy and a great friend. He's missed. I, although I've never done any of those, um, you know, the gatherings and the, and the anniversaries, the only thing I do remember is the times when, uh, as I'm sure you've all had, when soldiers, um, you know, war, people in the army now have come up to me and I can remember a couple of times and these guys, uh, you know, and the way they were trying to convey to me what this did to them. And you kind of go, yeah, you know, you, you know how you do. You kind of just go, yeah, oh, that's great, man. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. But. There was one guy who said it, and he, he was obviously so so profoundly touched by what we all did, and um, that was really touching, you know, because they were watching it. You know, they're out in combat watching watching what we made, you know, and it, mm -hmm. and for some of them, it might have gotten through the day, you know. So Neil Neil got shot in the lip. Somebody held the the M1, the weapon, too close to his face, shoots him <laughs> in the lip. <laughs> and then Neil's like, nah, he goes to the hospital or whatever. No anesthesia, no, you know, no local nothing, right? Neil, you got like three, five oh, stitches in your leg. I got a 50 cal, took my, this out of these teeth all got smashed up. Yeah. And but, but, but I, I no, remember, I'm sitting there and I'm so brainwashed at this point. And there I'm supposed to be this tougher guy, you know, Buck Compton. So I yell for Doc Rowe to come and stitch me up in front of everybody. Meanwhile, blood just dripping down, and, and Jay comes up to me, Neil, I'm not a doctor, I'm an actor. I'm like, yes, yeah. <laughs> and sits there, and he stitches this thing up, and after three days, it's so infected and so bad. So, uh, was Captain, it a muzzle sorry, blast, or was it just a physical no, hit? He came out of the window, we're, we're, we're enveloping this house, and all of a sudden this 50 cal came out and went, bang, smoked me oh, right shit. in the face. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Dale was like, you know, we have to send you to the hospital. It was, it was like one o'clock in the morning and Billy Budd took me and, and Dale was, was really, I'd never seen him that nervous because, you know, a couple a lot of other guys are getting hurt. A lot of guys are complaining. Even after Tom's great speech, guys were, were getting beaten up. And he was afraid that, you know, if, if I reported this, that, you know, they might shut the show down. So I got there, I'm still in my World War II fatigue, blood all over me. And, you know, beca because of socialized medicine, they said, uh, name please. I said, I said, Lynn Compton, serial number 4632940. And the lady's like, what? She thought I wasted. She said, nice I go in, the doctor sees it. He's like, holy cow, that's awful. He, he finally redressed it, did the whole thing. I get back to the barracks about four o'clock in the morning and I put it down in front of, uh, in front of Dale Dye. And it didn't say Neil McDonough, it said Lynn Compton. And he just looked at me with this huge shit eating grin. And, you know, because, you know, he, I don't know if it was taking it for the team or whatever it was, or if I was just completely brainwashed. Uh, and, and it was it was one of those moments that so I, I, I was so I was so proud to, to, to be part of that whole thing. You know, it was it was, it was great. It was it was amazing. I, I do want to say one thing about Kirk and that. Everyone talks to me so much about when I drop my helmet and, and Buck has his emotional breakdown. And they say, what were you thinking? You know, what went through your head? And, you know, it, and I get choked up thinking about it, watching Kirk do his amazing job that he did in that scene. And what I did was literally just react to exactly what Kirk was going through and what Joe Toy was going through. And all that emotion just rushed through me 
Uh, and, and I've never said it to Kirk, but Kirk, thank you for, for that performance because, you know, it, you know, I don't know what would have happened in that scene because it was such an important scene for not just my character, not just for me personally, but for, for Tracy Compton, for her family, for everyone who was watching, who was, everyone who was part of Buck's life. You know, so, uh, Kirk, love you, brother. And for the show. Thank it was an important you. moment for the whole show. All of you brought to life uh, characters that I had heard about and some who I had a chance to meet in person in, in later years. But quite honestly, tremendous job. All of you came across the way my dad described my entire life. Wow. Wow. That's, a, that's amazing. I'll never write anything like episode nine again. I mean, it, it is the thing I will be the most proud of for my whole life, no matter what else I ever do, ever, ever, ever. It is the single thing I am the most proud of, other than my kids and my marriage. And Well, I think Dime made a point earlier. Hey, brother. Uh, when we were standing next to each other at a, at a different time, you know, I think it was, was it day four, I think, day five, maybe. We're all exhausted. We're all, we've all had the snot beaten out of us, sleep deprivation, running miles, abuse by, by Captain Di and everybody else. And then the helicopter landed and Tom gets out of the helicopter and, you know, and does this speech to us about why we owe it to everyone to work our asses off and tell the truth because as, as not just as actors, but as young Americans and, you know, obviously British too, that we owed it to these guys to really tell the truth of the exact situation and not give up, not slow down, not be weak, go for, go for it as hard as you can and not make it about you, make it about the whole cohesive unit of what these guys were. And I think that permeated, as Richard said, through everything, with, with craft service, through props, through this. Everyone was in it for the common goal of telling the tr truth of the situation and giving honor to the guys who died for us. You know, what and, that, and, and that's what really, that's what kept us motivated throughout the whole year like like in donnie said episode eight everyone's crushed everyone's beat it's the end of the thing but no one quit no i mean boot camp was boot camp was just the actors and you know and, and you know we're representing not just joe toy i'm representing his legacy i'm representing his family i'm representing history so you don't want to be a fuck about actor on set cracking jokes we all were very serious we had fun we all were very serious about what we did there's a reason why we're having this thing i don't do these kind of things normally because i you know yeah you move on and i've got great memories but the, there was something about band of brothers and i've watched the whole the whole series again a couple of weeks ago and you know i can't judge what i worked on but i can judge other people's work and it's pretty remarkable and there's a reason it stayed at this level of popularity is because there was something indefinable about the quality of, of the, the show. And it's largely down to you guys, actors out there, I think. So thank you for helping me to be successful. Um, but that's how it all started. It all, it all started with, it all started upstairs in Winter's office really you know and it all started with a moment when i think he you know he and i really sparked and he realized that he could trust me and then everybody that was involved um carried that same spirit and, and those standards forward as as we went went ahead and tried to craft this thing but the thing i remember more than anything else uh <laughs> over the course of those really a year and a half i guess of the writing of the Bible and, that, and writing the screenplays was after every single phone call, uh, he'd always say the same thing at the end of the call, after a, you know, a two hour session about talking about his memories and the men and putting the men first and all that stuff. He'd always say the same thing. I'd say something like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow. I'll, I'll read you what I have. I'll, you know, I'll talk to you in the morning. And his answer was always the same. I'll be here. And I realized when years later, when Ethel asked me to deliver the eulogy at his memorial service, I incorporated that into the eulogy because there could never be two more or three more reassuring words than anybody could hear nowadays from a man like Richard Winters, I'll be here. You know, and the idea that he will be here as will the memories of all of these men who served as long as we remember them 
is sort of, you know, what I've lived by since.